All right, so uh, thanks everybody for hanging in there. Our next guest is uh, John Wiseman, G8BPQ. And uh, he was, uh, he became interested in electronics and ham radio at about 15 years old. He built receivers and transmitters and was licensed at about 17 and operated two meters AM. Uh, toward the end of the 80s, he came across Packet and built his first TNC, a TNC 220 kit and wrote a terminal software to go with this. Uh, when DeskView brought basic multitasking to DOS, he conceived BPQ code as a way of integrating the network benefits of NetROM with multiple copies of the BBS software uh, running on the same PC. Eventually, Windows moved on and no longer ran on top of DOS. At this point, he ported the 16-bit DOS code to Windows, and this became BPQ32. Then he started writing his own versions of a BBS and chat server and adding support for the for non-AX25 modes like Pactor uh, and eventually sound card modes like Winmore. When the Raspberry Pi was released, he realized it would be an excellent platform for running BPQ32 systems, so he ported the code to Linux, and this became LinBPQ. Around this time, he also added APRF, APRS mapping to BPQ32 and LinBPQ. John went back to his interest in hardware with the development of the TNC Pi and the DSTAR modem, uh, though the latter was overshadowed by the MMDVM system for digital voice. Uh, followed by the TNC 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 Pi 969K6, and uh, more recent, John, these are uh, nice acronyms here. More recent uh, BPQ32 Lin BPQ developments have been adding a webmail interface to the BBS and support for newer sound card modes such as RDOP and Vera. John's current projects are completing the port of UZ7HO sound modem to Linux, getting LinBPQ to run 64-bit versions of Linux, and developing a program to simply simplify creating BPQ configuration files while waiting to be allowed to go sailing. So, uh, so he's not sailing today. He's with us today, and I'd like to introduce John Wiseman. Hi. Today, uh, for a little bit of information for the audience, we're going to be doing a question and answer format. Um, so I'll start by saying thank you, John. Uh, thank you very much for taking the time to join us today and with the digital conference. And we'll start with the first question. How did you get started with Packet? Well, as was mentioned in the introduction, I started off building a PNC 220, although I suddenly remembered uh, a few years ago, I'd experimented with running view, um, video text over, over FM radio. That used a similar 1200 bone modification and was probably the sort of forerunner to packet. But anyway, with real packet, I started about 1988. So I built the TNC 220, and uh, that's where it all started. So how did the inspiration for the BPQ software itself, the original BPQ code, come to you? What was the, what was the light bulb moment? Well, at about that time, um, Netron was just being introduced um, and replacing DigiPeters on a lot of the sites, um, certainly in the UK, I guess, in the same other places. And there was some interest in uh, some ideas for a 9600 bone modem, which we RUH um, produced his design. And I realized that the standard TNC2 running Netron wouldn't have the capability of switching a number of 9600 streams. Also, the BBS software at the time was single user. And although Deskview had come along and you could run multiple copies of the BBS, each one still needs its own TNC. So I decided if I could combine the network aspects of Netron with a host interface that looked like a bank of TNC2s, I could put the whole thing in one PC and uh, get something that works a lot simpler and neater. So when we talked before, we talked a little bit about how the BPQ code evolved. One of the things that I thought was interesting was I'd originally asked you the question about how Windows 3.1 might have influenced the development. And I loved your answer, which was it didn't because we were just running the BPQ code within Windows and a, a, essentially a DOS compatibility window. But why don't you talk about some of the things that did drive the evolution of BPQ code ultimately to BPQ32? Well, I think basically Windows moved on. The earliest earlier versions of Windows were effectively loaded on top of DOS, so you could still run DOS programs underneath it. Um, 
towards the end of the, I don't know actually exactly when, but I, I dropped out of the scene a bit, about 1995 for a year or two. But when I came back, um, you couldn't do that anymore. So if you wanted to run BPQ with Windows, I had to produce a version which was a native Windows program. So that's basically when BPQ32 was born. Many people consider it common wisdom that the internet killed packet growth. Uh, how, uh, how did you perceive that the growth of the internet affected the development of your software? I think it changed the, the usefulness of it, really. I mean, at the time when I started, um, being able to send emails around the world um, in a day or two, often by amateur radio satellites, was quite exciting, and a lot of people got involved. Um, with the advent of internet and normal email, that became a lot less sort of exciting. And although a few hardcore enthusiasts stayed with packet, a lot of the people who were sort of the sort of experimental way of communicating dropped out. Um, I think that's basically what happened. I was, as I say, I wasn't exact, I wasn't actually part of the scene for those two or three years when it was probably all happening, certainly over here and maybe over in the States as well. Um, changing the licensing conditions in the UK also didn't help, which made it much more difficult to run standalone packet systems. You um, basically couldn't run unattended nodes without a, a lot of paperwork. So those two combined, I think, saw packet on a rapid decline. So I find it interesting that uh, actually it was exciting, maybe is a better word for me as I was discovering BPQ32 software, I, that it's got provisions for APRS within it. What thoughts do you have about the APRS approach to networking? Well, it's very different from the normal. Um, although it claims to use AX25, it really bends the rules so much. It's hard to really say that APRS is X25. Um, They've done it in a way that works very well for what APRS sets out to do, but it makes it incompatible with any other use of, the, of particularly the frequency, but also the protocols. So basically, I think APRS is going to stay its own way with um, basically datagram operate, operating over a, a rather clever, but um, not compatible with anything else, digipeating system. So one of the projects that you're working on completing is the porting of Andy's, uh, uh, the UZ7HO modem. Uh, what are your thoughts about hardware modems versus software modems? I think generally software modems now are at least as good at basically what, what, it, what you really want to a TNC for, which is to decode packets as uh, any of the hardware TNCs. Possible exception is the specialist modes like Factor where the so the SES Dragon is uh, still well ahead of anything that can be done on a sound card. But for anything else, I think um, software modems are of the, of the future. I think I doubt if many more designs will be produced for hardware modems. Can you expand a little on that thinking? I mean, surely, at least to me, there must be a place for hardware modems in this day and age. And I'm thinking particularly since software modems are so dependent on the processing hardware and on OS stability and admittedly not every OS out there is rock solid. Well, the distinction is a bit blurred anyway. Um, because even, you know, hardware TNC these days is likely to have a microcontroller in and the, the, actual, mo the actual modem itself would be software. Um, my TNC, well, TNC, TNC, TNC 9K6 is an example. It's a, a microcontroller running a, a port of um, on the sale of sound modem software. So though, you know, what do you call that? Is that a hardware TNC or a software TNC? Depends on your point of view. Well, yeah, I think that's a very good point. And that was what I was, I think, thinking about. So do you, you're working on the port of the UZ7HO modem right now. Do you have more work planned in this area? Um, I'm hoping to add the 9600 mode, um, which Andy has as a separate program, but I was hoping to get the source for that from him and, and combine the two together. But just to go back a moment, I, 
what I'd like to be able to do is to port the that code onto a microcontroller, so you do get you know, the stability of a microcontroller um, with the performance of the uh, sound card modes. Unfortunately, at the moment, it takes too much processing power and memory. But these microcontroller chips are developing very rapidly, and I hope it won't be too long before you know, protocols like that could actually be run in a what you might call a hardware TNC, certainly a box that doesn't need an operating system. Do you think that holds true with respect to the Pi 4's processing power? Do you still see, at least for that application, that it's just not quite enough? Well, the Pi 4 is fine, but if you want to build something like the, the nice K6 TNC using a, a microcontroller, I mean, mine uses a TNC 3.6, uh, which only has you know a couple of hundred megahertz clock, half a mega memory. And that just isn't enough to run modern sound card modes, which tend to use a lot of RAM to do you know, a lot of their error recovery and optimizations. So really, it's just maybe a bit of a waiting game, it sounds like to me. It, 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 I'm amazed at the fact that it seems like every year we have such incredible jumps in what the micros are capable of doing. I'm, so it sounds like, at least in your opinion, we're really only a short time away from that happening. True. The other option is to actually run something like a Raspberry Pi, but without an OS under it. I mean, it is possible to program them basically as an appliance and not have the potential problems of stability. I think Linux is actually pretty stable these days. But if your concern is running with a general purpose operating system, it may be sometime soon someone will come up with an, an idea of a sort of um, low level control software, which may, allows you to run these things basically without the OS. That's really interesting. So uh, we've been talking a little bit about the Pi TNC and the 96K projects. How did you become involved with those? Well, when the Pi was introduced, um, 2012, something like that, I think, I realized it would be a, a really good box for running a node like BPQ, but not necessarily plenty of other hand software around as well, which were happy on it. But I thought a TNC, which was the same footprint and preferably was stackable, so you could run multiple ports on the same on the same Pi, would be very useful. So um, I started off with a standard TNCX, and if I'm, what I'm going to try and do is put a picture up, which I had a lot of trouble with before. Right, I don't know if that's working, but... Uh, yes, it is working. Good, that's good. That's uh, basically a, a standard TNCX with a Pi connector super glued on the edge and minor changes to the software to make it work. Well, I don't know now, so I'll get rid of that. <laughs> You'll just uh, click on stop sharing. Is that on the... That picture? No, it's not, is it? Right, okay. Sorry. No, we can oh, leave it up, John. Yeah, don't worry about it. We'll just wait till then. You can mess with it while we're talking. So, yeah, um, yeah, just a slight bit of background. We were intending to record this, and uh, but unfortunately, that didn't quite come up to plan either. So it's been done live, and I'm not quite ready for it. Oh, it's. I think it's anyway, better. Basically, this way. having done that design, um, the code for the GNCX was already open source, and John Hansen agreed to give me the, the his board layout files. So I could relay the thing out um, to the Pi, Pi footprint, change the processor so it could use an IPC interface. And that became the TNC, the Pi TNC, TNC Pi, depending on who's talking. Um, and as John had obviously did sell the TNCX, it seemed obvious to offer him the chance to sell that. And he, I think he was a bit skeptical at first there'd be any interest. And he thought, well, I'll, I'll, I'll order 50 boards and see how it goes. And I think he ended up selling staying several thousand. So it worked out a lot better than either was expected. Well, I'll say my understanding is that that design is still in fact in demand. And I believe there's a West Virginia club that uh, is selling the kit, the 96K kit of all places on Etsy. That the whole idea of that makes me smile. Yeah, the, the board designs for the 9600 modem are published, and you can order the boards directly from uh, some of the PCB software manufacturers. And the TNC Pi, 
I think John still has the designs, but I think he has agreed other people can build it. Now he's uh, basically retired from the business. One slight stack is the modem chip we use is no longer made in as a as a DIL package, but there are surface mount versions. So if you're prepared to do a bit of surface mount soldering, you can still make them. Yeah. So this popularity, does this suggest that you'll continue to work with this design? Well, it hasn't really changed since you know, 2012, so it's unlikely I'm going to do anything with that one. The the nice K6 one, which is the processor-based one, you know, as processors get more powerful, um, hopefully I'll be able to put more software, use the design, run more software, as we were discussing earlier. The Team Z4 is a very nice chip, but it left out one vital thing, which was the, the DAC, so you can't actually feed audio into it. Or is it the way around, ADC? Whichever one it hasn't got. So. I thought that would be an excellent platform, but they've left the critical pin off the chip. So hopefully before long, there'll be another microcontroller coming out with even more power and with both an ADC and a DAC and we can get back in business with those. All right, so everybody in the audience, make note of that and write the manufacturers and start demanding that as a product. Earlier, we were talking about the the idea of hardware process or hardware TNCs versus software TNCs. And I think we touched on it briefly, but it seems through your experience that with the power of a Pi 4, we have the equivalent of a plug and play TNC, a software TNC that really can be treated like a hardware TNC in the Raspberry Pi and a sound modem. Yeah, I mean, you don't need a Pi 4 for the basic sound modem. I mean, it'll run on a single four, even, even on a Pi Zero, um, but it doesn't give you much scope for any much else. Um, certainly any of the any of the quad cores, the Pi 3s are fine. Pi 4 is now the same price as a Pi 3, so there's probably no point in buying anything else. But there's loads of power there. It uses about 30% of one core to run uh, sound modem. I've got a copy running here with the... Uh, to not put 300 bow decoders running and it's using about 30% of a quarter of the of the power. Yeah, you'd mentioned that when we were talking before that most of the capacity of the Pi was devoted to the, well, actually I'll let, I'm trying to remember exactly how you worded it before I don't have the my notes of that part of the conversation in front of me, but we talked about as you said, that the Pi 4 certainly wasn't necessary to most of the function of the TNC. That's right. You can run my, my port of Andy's sound modem on a, on a Pi Zero, which is a single core, um, but you can't really run anything else on it. You want to run other other modems or much other software like sort of APRs mapping and things at the same time, you probably really need at least a, a, port, a port core machine. So as a frolic and detour, I'd love to hear about your uh, any sense of national pride you might have or association with the Raspberry Pi? Well, I was certainly quite pleased to hear it came uh, when it was announced it would come from Cambridge. I actually studied there, so I had another connection with it. Um, the other good thing about it is it's actually made in Britain rather than in the Far East. So uh, all in all, it's uh, both a very successful product and now completely British, which I think makes a nice change. Yes, it does, doesn't it? So if you could talk for a little bit about uh, your history of development with the Pi. When we talked before, you had said that you had had some experience early on with it. Um, not quite sure what you're referring to. But yeah, oh, basically... when... Sorry, Kyle. Uh, when we had talked before, you had talked about some of your experience with the Pi prior to the port of BPQ to Lin BPQ when you started directly working with the Pi, also at the same time when you were doing the Pi TNC design. I was kind of asking about what did you do with the Pi prior to that time? Um, I think there must be a slight misunderstanding. I, I'd worked with Linux for quite a long time. The Pi, pretty much the first thing I did when I got one was to start porting BPQ to use Lin BPQ. Since then, I've developed another few, quite a few other things. I've got a one that runs my boat's navigation system and various other bits around the house. So the, the Pi is running quite a lot of things, but 
actually the, the ham radio use was the thing I, I first saw, first was interested in when I saw it, when I saw it first announced. So back to our discussion, we were talking about 9,600 baud. Do you see a specific use case for 9,600K? I think it's just a natural progression. I don't think we originally started running 1,200 because it was a good speed. It was just all we could do at the time um, with available modem chips. And basically, people like faster links, I think. If you're just using it for chatting, 1,200 is fine. But as soon as you want to start forwarding messages around, um, you really need something faster. And I think it's just a natural progression rate to move to 9600 uh, if you can. So how about uh, radio recommendations? Radios are certainly a, an important part of the package. What, uh, what thoughts do you have about them? Well, in my experience, any radio which is has a, a connector on the back label 9600 packet is quite likely to work. I obviously haven't tried them all, but the few I've used have always worked well. If you don't have a, a 9600 data connector, you've probably got to hack into the into the um, radio itself, and I probably wouldn't recommend that. I run a few of the FT series, FT7800, 7900s, and they seem to work fine. Um, the built-in sound card on some of the modern multi-modes like the IC7100 works really well at 9600 as well, although it's a bit overkill for a, a packet radio. Um, what was really nice was a long time ago now, the Tantronics data radio of the early 90s, which was a 77 radio, which did 9600 and 92. And uh, that was a really nice thing for setting up packet radio links. We had a few of them around our network at the time, but unfortunately that's gone out of production a long time ago. Do you think there's potential for going to faster data rates given the constraints of a 20 or 25 kilohertz channel, uh, particularly with existing radios? Um, not a lot. You know, Bar FM, I think, now gets up to about 17K. And I suspect that's getting close to the theoretical limit for a 25K channel. Maybe not. But 25K channel is not really 25K bandwidth. It's about half that in practice because you've got a bit of a guard band on each side. And that's probably the limit. If you want to go faster, you probably need to go wider bandwidth. And I think, at least in the States, your regulations make that difficult. At least over here, we don't have these uh, channel bandwidth limitations. So if we wanted to, we can run. 50k, 100k channels. Um, although interestingly, amateur television, digital TV seems to run quite happy to get away with running much faster bit rates, and maybe some of their technology could be adapted to give us high-speed uh, data links. So, speaking more about the Raspberry Pi and the computing power that those devices make available. Uh, what sorts of possibilities do you see with new modulation techniques or new protocols? I'm not really an expert in DSP, so there are other people who give better view. But all, what I've seen is rapid development. You know, along you know, started off with the 500. We had Win, we had Winmore, um, Rick, um, who should have spoken earlier, but unfortunately, you expect it didn't develop Dardoff, and Varo just takes things a whole new step forward. But I can't believe that's the end because the computers get more powerful and uh, and software writers get cleverer. I think uh, that development will continue. Well, given the continued general increase in computing power, not just the Pi, but in desktops and elsewhere, and the fact that our hobby is about experimentation do you see or expect to see more experimentation in this area? There is a bit going on. I can't remember the name of it now, but there's a, a group, I think they're in I think, he's, I think they're in France, or a guy in France who's developed a, a, 256, a 250K or thereabouts data radio. Um, it actually runs IP rather than AX25, which is uh, probably sensible at those sort of bandwidths. So things are going on. They're just in small pockets and uh, they're not necessarily all that well known outside their you know, the small circle of people familiar with them. Well, and I recall when we talked before that we had both shared the 
I guess the concern or the wonderment about new people coming into the hobby that were predisposed to experiment in that area. Um, what do you what do you see from your perspective? I would imagine new users are emailing you. Do you see new people coming to the hobby to experiment or what's your experience? There, there are, there are certainly people who talk to me who are experimenting with various software, either networking software or applications to run alongside things like PPQ code. And so there certainly are people doing both software and hardware development. I don't probably don't come across all that many of them but uh, you know, I have a few regular correspondents who say, you know, what's it, you know, as I'm thinking, I'm having a bit of problem with this, can you suggest how I get around it, sort of thing. So there are things going on. So earlier you'd mentioned the Cantronics data radio and the data engine. Can you talk about that hardware and why you liked it so much? So the, the data engine was a, a TNC, but rather than the Z80 processor, which for virtually all the TNCs before it had, um, it had a, an Intel compatible, and I think it was an 8188 or 8186 um, embedded version of the uh, Intel 8088, 80, sorry, 8086. So it would run effectively the BPQ software that had been written to run on a on a DOS PC. And I thought that would make a really good platform for a particularly a, a hilltop, a tower top node. Certainly in those days, you wouldn't want to stick a real, you know, one of the original PCs on the top of a tower. It probably wouldn't last very long. Um, it was a really nice design. It had slots for two modems, and they produced 9600 and 19K2 modems, which were compatible with the data engine. And uh, we have quite a few running in this country. There's basically hilltop nodes with a couple of bus trunk links going in on the 9600 ports. And it also has a serial port, which you multi-drop standard KISS TNCs or standard Netron TNC2s to create user access channels. So it was a very nice box. And again, unfortunately, it's gone. Do you think that hardware is still relevant or should we just use a Pi? Generally, I'd use a Pi, but if I was putting it somewhere where it was had it in environmental extremes or very difficult to get at. Um, inherently, it's probably more stable. Um, although, given the fact they're now 20 odd years old, perhaps that is a bit of a dangerous statement. But uh, if, I had, if I had one and I wanted some remote site, I, I, I certainly still consider using it. Well, why don't we talk now about the BPQ32 package? Um, it seems to me the place to start is what would the average ham want to do with BPQ32 in their shack computer? That's always the problem. People ask me, what, does BPQ, what is BPQ? What does it do? It does so many things. It's started life as basically an AS25 Netron packet switch. It still is that. But it's now the center of a, a set of applications, the BBS, which is pretty much compatible with FBBBS BBS, and uh, includes a webmail interface. It is compatible with WinLink. You can send and run it as a WinLink client. BPQ32 itself can run as a, as a WinLink RMS um, server station. Um, there's a chat server, which is at one time was part of the BBS, didn't it anymore. And there's an international chat network, which runs primarily with links over the internet, unfortunately, but that's live with 50 odd nodes in it. Um, has APRS now, if you're interested in APRS, there's a, a mapping thing. And I think I can have another picture I can bring up if I have any luck. If you don't, I do have the node map here. Well, this is the uh, APRS network map. So that's, if you run BPQ APRS, that's basically what you'll see, um, obviously zoomed in. That's my. I have two QTHs. One in just off the north coast, northwest coast of Scotland. See the top left-hand corner of that screen, and then one in the centre of England at Nottingham. So yep, that's my other QTH, which I'm now not, haven't been allowed to go to for many weeks due to the lockdown. But that's uh, hopefully won't go on for all that much longer. Right. I'll get rid of that. The other thing is the network map, which you mentioned. 
which shows all the currently live Oh, well, never mind. No, can't see it. There is a, a map which shows all the BPQ nodes which are configured to report to it, which is probably most, but certainly not all. There's about 500 nodes on that. Actually, you might be able to find that if I. Again. <laughs> No, I give up on that. I'm getting back to where I was. Sorry about that, folks. So, where the grant you've got that, you could stick up. Yep, I'll do that right this moment. I'll take the. Scott, I can't get off. Okay, we'll just move on. Right. Am I gone? No, sorry. I was just messing. I thought one more click and I'd be able to share it, but we'll just move on. So let's see. So you talked about the list of things that it'll do, the BPQ mail, the web interface. Uh, did, you talked about it being compatible with FBB, correct? Correct, yes. Yeah. Did we talk yeah. about WinLink? Yeah, it is yeah, it is basically can it, it can run the WinLink forwarding protocol, so it can uh, send and you can use the WinLink client programs like RMS Express to um, sorry, I'm talking myself here. Use RMS Express to uh, act as a client to the BBS, but also forward using the WinLink system to send emails. Um, it has a webmail interface which allows you to use the um, WinLink forms, which is a basically a way of sending quite nicely formatted data, but only saying the data and, and keeping the formatting information locally. And there's an interface to that in there. And I've actually found now found my node back, so I'm going to get back to that for a moment. While you're working on that, it really does sound like BPQ32 is sort of a digital Swiss Army knife. Um, well, I see it like that. I mean, it probably has far too many options for its own good, really, which makes configuring it difficult, which is why one of my projects is to try and find an easy way of doing it. Um, can you see that map now? Has that appeared? Yes, we can. Yeah. So that's basically um, the nodes that are currently active on the network and reporting to the map. If you have a, a some of the networks are, are actually radio only, don't have access to the internet, so obviously can't report to a central server. But that's around 500 nodes which are currently running the BPQ software. I'm going to say something else. I'll talk to myself. So, oh, yeah. oh. you know, you carry on. <laughs> okay. Well, I was just going to ask what other software uh, things can we expect? Um, not a lot at the moment. I'm, I've got quite a few things on the go. The, the user 7H show modem port, the configuration stuff, and just keeping the software going is getting on for a full time job. There are always people asking for new features or finding obscure bugs. Um, one thing that we haven't mentioned and perhaps we put at some point is is the IP capability. Um, you did have a question about IP before. I don't know whether you want to bring that in or whether um, I'll uh, carry on. Well, yeah, we could discuss that now. I had in our list, we had the, the next was to discuss some of the interesting requests that you've received from users. So we could talk about that and then get into the discussion about TCP IP? Well, quite a lot of the features. In fact, support for HF protocols, you know, um, Factor and so on, was actually a request from a user. And that led to a whole development of basically the, the non-AX25 side of it. Now supports a range of Factor TNCs, RDOP with more VARA. You can use it with multi-PSK and FLDG to use any of their modes. But 
connecting two or between nodes. That opened up a whole new, basically, area. The APRS side also was something I wasn't particularly interested in, but again, some users suggested it'd be nice to have, first of all, an APRS digipeter. As I said earlier, APRS does things rather differently than normal packet. And then the mapping. So, Webmail, I think, was also a user suggestion. So yeah, that's the... Basically, things get done. If either I want them for myself, or if someone suggests them and it seems like there'd be a lot of interest, or if someone suggests them, which may not have a lot of interest, but I think might be quite fun, they're the sort of things that get done. So do you uh, want to talk about uh, your views about TCP IP now, or do you want to shunt that to later? I'm happy now. OK, let's tackle that, and then we'll get back to the list of questions. So what do you think about TCP IP over amateur radio? Yeah, I mean, I think you, when we, we, when we tried to record this, you had a question about, you know, could we move to running IP over X25? And yes. the answer was that uh, right from the early days, even before X25, um, people were running IP over amateur radio links using UI frames. And it works. Um, CPQ software supports it. It will let you connect to the 44, the uh, 44 net, the amateur radio the private network uh, over tunnel things. But it just seems to me it's a very efficient waste of bandwidth. It's, there's a 40 byte, 40 byte TCP IP header and sticking them on top of a path lane of 256 uh, makes rather a mess. I mean, there are techniques for um, concatenating packets and things. But to my view, my view, why bother? I mean, the networking protocols we have, Netcom particularly, was designed for amateur radio, I think. It actually bears a remarkable similarity to a, a standard ISO level 3 protocol, but that, that may or may not be coincidence. It uses call signs for addressing rather than numbers, and that makes it a natural fit into the need to identify within ham radio. So though, yes, you can run IP over links even down to 1200 bow packet links. I, don't really see the point myself. I'm sure that would cause a lot of uh, interest. So why don't we take some of this a little bit out of order before from what we discussed before. I'd like to talk about BPQ 32's future. One of the things that's always on my mind is kind of the the end to projects when when you see these single single person development operations that have had an unfortunate end and we talked about UI view as being a, a strong example of that there are good examples too uh, for example chirp that as Dan's focus changed the user community met working with Dan did a phenomenal job of continuing chirp on and very robust support for users by the community thinking far into the future, have you thought about where BPQ32 might go when you get tired of working on it? I don't really expect to get tired of working on it, but I'm not going to last forever. Um, the source, it's all open source and the source is available. So anyone who wants to work on it can. I think the real cool UI view is when Roger died, he didn't make the source hadn't been made available. And uh, once he'd gone, I think it's too late. So that is all available. In fact, uh, rather morbidly, uh, quite a few years ago, someone suggested I should upload the, the code in case anything happened to me. I as I just taken up sailing at the time. <laughs> so that was kind of worrying. But uh, anyway, since then, the, the, soft, the, the source is always available. Um, people do tinker with it, not, not a lot. And although the, you know, the higher level stuff, the BBS and all that is, is relatively straightforward, there aren't actually all that many people with uh, expertise in writing uh, communication protocols, but you know, anyone who wants to, you know, the sources there, play and uh, if you come up with any ideas, I'll gladly add them. Well, and you would even mention that people have assisted you with bug fixes. They've sent you information that they've taken care of it and then you- Yeah, yeah, that happens from time to time. People say, you know, you got this line wrong, change that and it'll work, or it's crashing here. They've gone with the debugger and found where it's crashing and said, you know, that's the line you've got to fix. So that's always very nice. So sounds to me like you welcome the involvement of others in this project. Oh, sure, yeah. Excellent. 
So you're probably in a unique position to see new ideas and developments around the, um, particularly the European uh, packet community, but just in general. So what kinds of things are you seeing? Um, not a lot of, apart from things like Vara, which is really groundbreaking in terms of its performance. It, I mean, it, come, it, it doesn't quite reach it, but it comes close to performance of Pact or 4, which is you know, thousands of pounds of dollars for a box. So um, even though it's not open source, it's not really expensive. And it's uh, probably the main development in the improved protocols that we've had for a while. Um, as I mentioned earlier, there's some guys experimenting with wideband link um, running on 77, which we can do here, but I don't think you can, unfortunately, in 100k, 200k wide channels. Um, another interesting thing which is coming along is the uh, geostationary satellites. Um, unfortunately, it doesn't cover the states, but there's now a, a geostationary satellite with an amateur radio transponder on it, and that gives I think it's around two mega bandwidth. I can't remember exactly. It's divided up between video and you know, basically a conventional um, audio type channel. Um, you can access it with a relatively small dish. Uh, downlink can be a normal TV satellite receiving disc. You need a fairly small seven, uh, 23 sem uplink aerial. And that basically gives you worldwide coverage or third of the globe coverage, let's put it that way. Um, anyone within the footprint of the satellite can basically link up. I haven't seen a lot of experiments. I've certainly seen people saying, oh, we put a bit of hard up through that or VARA or even conventional packet, but there doesn't seem to be any coordinated move to use that. I think that may well come. Certainly something I'd like to play with when I run out of other things to do and get back to my UTH where I have all my radio gear. So, um, in seeing these developments, it suggests that we're seeing a resurgence in the interest in packet radio. Do you think that's an accurate statement? I think that's true, yes. Um, certainly over the last several years, I've seen a lot more people coming on in the local area. I think APRS never really went away, but apart from that, there was virtually no packet. I, you know, I say around the, around the, just around the UK, but I say a lot, and I leave, leave a radio running. And, so you hear virtually nothing on the packet frequencies except APRS when I started. These days, at least there are some places where you'll find people starting to set up more conventional packet networks. There's quite a few people running DPQ now in the UK, setting up DBS and with local access links, and they have a few local users, less than they'd like, I'm sure, because it's very frustrating to set something up and then find no one wants to use it. But there are more people coming on. and. Uh, I think it's having a bit of a resurgence. I don't think it's ever going to get back to like it was in the sort of mid nineties, but it's it's gradually going there. So we've got uh, a question from the YouTube stream. Uh, Scott printed this out so easy to read. I'm having to squint to even read the call sign. So we'll, the question is from N7 NIX. And they ask, is there a way to configure BPQ32 to use the Linux AX25 socket interface? Um, there is, but I wouldn't recommend it. That's another contentious thing to say. I don't like the AX25 kernel implementation. I think in some ways it's flawed, but it certainly hasn't evolved and been maintained to the same standard as the AX25 protocol stacks that are outside it. Not just mine, but Use those seven HOs protocol stack is much better optimized for working on HF than standard Linux kernel stack. Um, yeah, you can connect to it as, as a virtual KIST TNC, and I have done it and it works, but it seems an odd way to go to me. So we've got another question. I don't have the name of the person that asked it, but the question is could Vera? Uh, could Vera HF, if licensed, run on the Teensy Pi? And if WinLink implemented your version of RDOP, how would it compare with Vera HF and Pactor 3 and 4? Two, three questions. Um, Vara is only available on Windows. I've offered, I've asked, offered to Jose to, to port it to Linux, and he does, he's not interested. So, unless he changes his mind, I, won't, I don't think there'll be a Linux version. I don't think he's interested in doing that. Um, 
you know, he may be persuaded to change, in which case I'll, I'll have a go at it. He probably wouldn't run on a team, but it almost certainly run on a Pi 4. Um, performance wise, RDOP is, is a disappointment in some ways. It promised a lot and it seemed to have stopped. Um, RDOP 1 basically works. It's in some circumstances it's better than win more. In, some cases not, and generally I think it probably is. Um, I think RDOP, there is an RDOP 3 which promises a lot more, but again, in, you know, basically how, how it works is that it, uh, Rick from the WinLink team develops the things, and I just port them to Linux. So I'm not really, I really don't have the DSP expertise to write these things, so I'm quite happy to port them. And RDOP 3 works nearly all the time, but when it doesn't, it doesn't, it fails to work catastrophically. So that needs fixing. And uh, that will, it won't get us, it won't get us anywhere. It won't get near to Vara. It might get to half the rate, possibly. Um, the Vara proponents will claim it's better than um, Factor 3. Um, I think that probably depends very much on the channel you're running it on. It certainly, at its fastest, it is very fast but it does need a good signal to do that. It also needs a lot of bandwidth. And I think particularly in the States, you are very short of um, bandwidth for automatic operation. My understanding is very, very limited bandwidth to run 3K CY signals. And this, a mode that can run in 500 hertz mm -hmm. is much more useful. And for, unfortunately, VARA won't. So either on bands where you can't run wideband, like over there, but here we're not allowed to run more than 500 that's bandwidth on 30 meters. You can't use VARA, and RDOP is quite a nice choice then. The next question is simple. Where is the live development repository? There isn't. <laughs> the source is posted as it's released. It isn't, there isn't a development, the development source isn't posted. It, each released version is uploaded to my website along with the object code. There we go. And the next question I have is, could you put it into GitHub? Well, I could. <laughs> um, I did try. I, I never could get on with GitHub. I don't know why. It was a blind spot somewhere. And I couldn't see how to integrate it with my development software. And every time it just got out, it got out of date so fast, it just wasn't worth it. Um, I'm sure it must be possible to to link um, basically my source code. I use uh, subversion um, S uh, source control. There must be a way of doing it, but I never managed to find it. If anyone out there can point me at a way of doing it, I would be happy for it to automatically update GitHub if it didn't involve me in any any work to make sure it stayed in step. Well, we'll have to give our uh... Club President Lawrence, uh, at the tap on the shoulder to help you with that. That sounds promising. <laughs> oh, yes, he says, Lawrence, our, uh, like I said, our president, AG7 NB, says, I can help with, he said, five exclamation points after it. So Excellent. He's, he, he's on board. Uh, do we have any more questions? I, it looks like that's about it, John. So I'll, okay. uh, I'll, I'll ask you the very last question. What do you predict for the future of Packet? We shall have a crystal ball. Um, certainly, faster. probably most things we discussed, faster modes in existing bandwidths. If you can sort out your licensing regulations, probably faster mode in wider bandwidths, particularly on the DHF, um, HF, um, UHF bands. Um, the geostationary satellites are quite interesting. Um, there are some experiments with forward error correction. Um, one of the problems is that the packet network, particularly the APIs, is so established, it's very difficult to introduce something that's not compatible with it. Um, forward error correction can make a big difference, especially on things like APRS, which use um, UI frames without any acknowledgement. And there could be more development developments in that. FX25 works and it's in um, Andy sound modem, but it, because it's designed to be compatible with ordinary X25, it is suboptimal really. 
makes a big difference, especially on HF. You can get a lot more stuff through on noisy um, HF channels running. Even conventional 300 bone packet can move a lot of data given a, a good signal, and it helps with that. So hopefully more work in, in error correction. Possibly a new pro protocol if you can persuade someone to adopt it. But if someone says, you know, it's not going to be compatible with any existing TNC, it has to be new hardware, new software, it puts you on the back foot uh, right from the start. That's all very interesting. I am incredibly grateful, and I think the amateur community as a whole is incredibly grateful to you for taking the time to speak with us today as we talked about when we, I first approached you. Uh, this is the first time that uh, you've been asked to speak publicly about PDQ and uh, PDQ code, PDQ 32, and the whole suite of software. So hopefully uh, that'll change and we'll see you uh, on the ham channels more. Well, I've enjoyed it and I, I don't like doing presentations, but I'm quite happy to do questions and answer things like this. So uh, I think it's worked out fairly well. You did a. And thanks for the invite. Oh, yes, you did a fantastic job. This was lovely. So, Will, uh, John will be moving over to the breakout room in just a moment. That's a Zoom breakout room where we'll have uh, the you'll have the opportunity to ask him direct questions. I'll uh, remind all our viewers to be courteous because we don't want to ban anybody. And uh, I'm going to pass this back over to Scott Honecker, N7SS, while we get ready for our next speaker. Uh, Jim KH6HTV will be talking about digital TV, high, high, amateur high definition digital television coming up next.